Welcome to Living Answers for Today. I'm Dr. George Westlake, Pastor Emeritus at Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, and here to answer questions about the Word of God and to help with problems that you might be having in the Christian life, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that He is the answer to the complex problems you face today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, it's never dumb to ask questions. That's how we find out. Now, we suffer. We have some questions that have been sent in on Facebook, uh, uh, on the internet, and then other ones you can call right in. You can't call, but you can write right down. You can type it in or write it in, and then my daughter will uh, she'll write the questions down and hand them to me live, and I'll answer them live. I love live questions and answers program. I love not knowing what people are going to ask ahead of time, but we do have a lot of it ahead of time, and that's fine. But I like I like the liveness of a live Bible question and answer program. So we're going to go ahead, right ahead, and start answering some questions that we have. Romans talks about submitting to government. Should Christians submit to government at all times? It depends on what the government says. It's like when they came to Jesus and said, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? And Jesus said, uh, show me a coin. He asked them who's, uh, uh, whose face is on the coin. He said, Caesar's. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. We should be loyal to government except where they cross the line that is contrary to what the Bible says. That is contrary. And if it, you know, if the Bible gives a direction and the government says you can't do it, then you have to go ahead and do it because we have to go according to the word of God. Government is good. Government is needed as long as it does not interfere with the word of God and what the Word of God teaches, and we need to take a stand. I think it's about times Christian made a loud voice about the things that are going on in our country that are contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. And many places the government tries to do things contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. So we go along with government unless it disagrees with the Word of God. And God's Word is very clear, the way God expects us to live and the practices He expects us to have, okay? And I have a note from my daughter that she made a couple weeks ago. If you have questions, put them in the comment section, and I'll answer them first. Uh, uh, so you can write them down. You can write them in and send them in, and we will take those first, okay? The next one here, Romans 4.17. What is meant by God who calls those things not as though they were? Well, it's a promise of God. And it's actually talking about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. He believed God. And God put it down to his account for righteousness. He believed the promises of God. And God told him, you're going to have a son. He calls things that are not as though they were. And when he came to Abraham, when he was 99 years old, and says, you're going to have a son, Abraham laughed, wouldn't you? Suppose you went, I went to a, a local hospital and they saw an old guy walking around and saying, what you doing, old timer? Say, well, my wife's going to have a baby. Oh, you have a young wife? Yes, yeah, she's only 90. But God said Sarah's going to have a son. And she had a son when she was 90, and Abraham was almost 100. Because God calls them, God knows the head, God can give a promise, and when God gives a promise, it's going to happen. For instance, you read some of the prophecies of the coming Messiah in the Old Testament, it acts like he's already there or soon to come. And yet it was several hundred years, several hundred years. Back in the Garden of Eden, God told Eve, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And that happened when Jesus came hundreds and hundreds of years later. Uh, he told Abraham, you're going to have a son. And he had to wait till he was almost 100. He was 99 when the promise came. And Sarah had the son. Abraham was about 100 years old. And the book of Hebrews says he considered his body dead. I know the King James says he didn't consider his body dead. Actually, the Greek says he considered his body dead. And he also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. And yet he believed the promise of God. And so we have to stand on the promise of God. And when God says something's going to happen, it's absolutely going to happen. Okay. Uh, you read the promise in Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born and the son is given. And God the son was born as a child. God the son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will sit upon the throne of David to establish it with judgment and justice even now and forever. For the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. And yet it didn't happen for 700 years. 
It acted as though it was happening right now. So God calls things that are not as though they are. Glad we serve a God that knows the end from the beginning. How can I overcome perfection? How can I overcome perfectionism? Okay, I'm feeling like I'm never enough. That's just a lie of the enemy. You know, the Apostle Paul, you need to read Philippians. The Apostle Paul in the Roman prison on death row, because there were those in the Philippian church, obviously, that thought they had arrived. He wrote to the Philippians, and he says, I have not yet taken a hold of that for which I was taken a hold of by God. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and stretching to the things that are before, I press toward the mark for the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if you want to be perfect, be like-minded. He's not finished with you yet either. It's a lifetime process of becoming. Uh, here when I preached at Sheffield Family Life Center about a month ago, I used an illustration to close the sermon. And I went up to the keyboard and I started playing chopsticks. And before I started playing, there was I mentioned there was a little boy 10 years old and he wouldn't practice his piano. And the maestro Paderewski was coming to their city. And it was a free concert. And the mother thought if she could take the little boy to hear the maestros that he would be willing to practice the piano. So the mother and the 10-year-old boy got to the concert an hour before it was to start. You can imagine a 10-year-old boy an hour before a concert to start trying to sit still. And about eight minutes before the concert was to start, they heard chopsticks on the piano. That's, a, that, uh, that's about the simplest song you could ever learn. And people started screaming, get that kid off the piano. Where is his mother? Ushers, get the kid off. He's touching the maestro's piano. And Paderewski came out from behind the scene. And the little boy was playing chopsticks. And he said, young man, keep playing. Keep on playing. Don't you quit. Keep it up. And Paderewski reached around a little boy while he was playing and made a concerto out of chopsticks. The best any of us can do for God is chopsticks, but he reached around us to us and make something beautiful for his glory and for his kingdom. Don't put yourself down. That's the enemy. He is the accuser of the brothers, it says in the book of Revelation. He accuses us day and night. He comes along. You're not what you ought to be. And I tell people when he sings his taunt song, you're not what you ought to be. You're not what you ought to be. You need to sing back. He's not finished with me yet. He's not finished with me yet. We'll never get to that place. We'll never get to the place of perfection until we see him face to face. That's what First John says. Now we're the sons of God, meaning legal heirs. Doesn't appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But every man that has his hope in him keeps on purifying himself. It's a continuous action, even as he's pure. So God's not finished with any of us yet. He's still working on us, and we're going to make it when we stand in his presence. So the best way to get over perfectionism is understand that. Just do it, keep doing your best for living for God, and God will take care of the rest. Thank God for that. He takes care of the rest. Okay, we had one. What is the best way to teach the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament? Is to teach that the Old Testament has a great deal of spiritual truth. Uh, there was a little, a little phrase I learned in Bible college that the new is in the old contained meaning every truth in the New Testament has its seed back in the Old Testament, but the old is by the new explained. The New Testament explains much of the Old Testament, that the sacrifices, for instance, were looking forward to Jesus dying on the cross, that the Ten Commandments, the ritual of the Ten Commandments, were insufficient for people to keep. They had no power to keep the law. And they had to bring animal sacrifices by faith. And the best way to teach it is to tell them there are pictures of New Testament truth, but we are not under that Old Testament legalistic law. And some people today try to put Christians under that law. So many passages in the New Testament show that the Christian is not under the Old Testament law. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Colossians that, that uh, it actually shows Satan 
uh, waving the Old Testament, waving the Ten Commandments, and saying you can't have George Westlake, he sinned, is called a certificate of indebtedness in the book of Colossians. You can't have George Westlake, he's broken all ten of these Ten Commandments, you can't have him. And he goes on to say, Jesus took that out of the way and nailed it to his cross and spoiled principalities and powers. That's old English for carrying off what somebody has as treasure for yourself, as spoil. And so I say, Jesus came and carried me off from the power of the enemy when he nailed that to the cross. He goes on to say, let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day of the new moon or a Sabbath, which are only a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. We have to teach them we're not under those kind of legalisms. But there's so much great spiritual truth in the Old Testament. Prophecies looking forward to Jesus coming. Prophecies about the end of time in the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel and the book of Isaiah and all these prophecies. The whole Old Testament is very valuable as long as we don't try to put ourselves under the legalism of the law. In the book of Galatians, Paul gives seven reasons why we are not under that Old Testament law. And he even calls the Galatians, I know our King James Bible says, you foolish Galatians. It's the same word that Socrates used to call the students stupid. And he said, you foolish Galatians, were you made perfect by faith or by the keeping of the law? What makes, were you saved by the hearing of faith or the keeping of the law? What makes you think you're made perfect now by keeping the law? And he goes on to give seven different reasons why we are not of the law. One of them, he says, literally, our school's, uh, the law was our school slave to bring us to Christ. The school slave was the one to take the little boy by the hand and would lead him to the teacher for the teacher to teach during the day. And he says the school slave was our, the law was our school slave to lead us to Christ. But now that Christ has come, we are no longer under the school slave. That's just one of the seven arguments in the book of Galatians. And uh, he indicates that trying to be saved by keeping law is flesh. The first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews point out to the Jewish Christians that they are not under that law. Second Corinthians chapter three points out, we are not under that law. The law has vanished. It has been done away with. We also read, we read in Romans six, that we are not under the law, but under great. Now the principles of the law are still the same, but not the legalisms of the law. What's the difference? Well, some people say under the law, you had to keep the Jewish Sabbath. Yet the early church, when you read about it, worshiped on what they called the day of the Lord, Sunday. John in Revelation 1 says, I became in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the technical term for the first day of the week. And many of the early church Christian authors from the first and second century point out that the early church worshiped on Sunday, Resurrection Day. If you read the book of Acts, they went into the synagogue on Sabbath day and ministered to the Jews. If you read Acts chapter 20, Paul was in Troas for seven days. And it says on the first day of the week when the brothers came together to break bread. But Paul points out in Romans that it doesn't matter what day you keep. Some people keep every day alike, some keep every day special. And he goes on to point out there are certain things we are not under those kind of legalisms anymore. Basically, you can keep Thursday if you want to keep Thursday, or you can even keep every day alike, according to that part of Romans, chapter 14 and 15. Just don't try to put it on other people. But then he goes on to say, receive one another. In other words, you keep Saturday, I keep Sunday, but if we know Jesus Christ, we need to receive one another. Uh, you think you get... Uh, you think you can't eat pork. I like pork. Okay, but receive one another. Romans chapter 14 and 15. Some people believe they can eat everything. Some people that are weak in faith eat herbs, but receive one another. That's the important thing. So legalists, so we have to teach them the history and the prophecies and the moral truth of the Old Testament are great. And we need to read the Old Testament, but we don't have to keep the legalisms that are there. What is the abomination of desolation? Well, it's referred to, first of all, in the book of Daniel. The abomination of desolation actually took place. You can read in Daniel 11 that it actually took place under a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. He is also referred to in Daniel chapter 8. He is called the king of the north in big parts of the book of Daniel. 
and he was an enemy against Israel. You can read more about him in the historical book called the Maccabees. And the Maccabees describe his time when he persecuted the Jews, crucified a lot of them. Uh, if a mother allowed her boy to be her little baby to be circumcised, they crucify the mother with a dead baby around her neck. That was the kind of persecution they were doing. And uh, the, the abomination of desolation was when he took a sow and offered it on the altar of God in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, just defiling the temple of God. Now, a man by the name of Judah Mac, Judas Maccabees drove him out. And by the way, they had to cleanse the temple. And while they were cleansing the temple, they found enough oil for the menorah for one day. That's a sevenfold candlestick. And it lasted eight days. That's where the Feast of Hanukkah comes from. It lasted eight days instead of just one. It's a great story, but the abomination of desolation took place in the Holy of Holies. Now, Jesus in Matthew 24 basically indicates it's still future. So it's what, call, what is called a double fulfillment of prophecy. It's going to take place in the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem. And the book of Daniel indicates that there is a period of time in Israel's history. There is a seven-year period left, according to the prophecy of the 77s, when the world, a world leader called the Antichrist or the mystery of iniquity or the man that shall come or the willful king or the king of fierce countenance or the great businessman, he will make a seven-year covenant with Israel in regard probably rebuilding the temple. And he says, in the midst of the seven years, he will cause the sacrifice and ablation to cease. That means the temple has to be built by the middle of what's called the great tribulation period. He will cause the sacrifice and ablation to cease because the only place the Jews can do that is the temple. And it indicates that he will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. When you read the book of Revelation, it says the false prophet will cause people to worship the image of the Antichrist, and whosoever will not worship that image will be killed. All right? They have to have the name or the mark or the number of the beast. So he will have his image in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, and that's what's called the abomination of desolation in the future. Okay. There's a lot of pictures in the Old Testament that show what's going to happen in the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, What's the difference between grace and mercy in the Bible? It's very difficult to decide. Mercy is when you see someone with a desperate need and you help them. That's primarily the meaning of mercy. However, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word chesed, and I always told my students, you have to be able to, I have to be able to do that to speak Hebrew. Okay, chesed, and the last letter is a v sound, and uh, in the Old Testament, it's equal to agape love in the New Testament. And that comes from Dr. Stanley Horton, who's, who's the most brilliant man I've ever met in my life. I had the privilege of taking Hebrew from him. Hesed in the Old Testament is equal to agape love. Now, agape love is that 100% giving of self, 100%. That's what I tell married couples. It's not a 50-50 relationship. It's 100%, 100% giving of self. That's agape love. 1 Corinthians 13 describes it. And it uses the word agape. And even after the resurrection, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you have agape for me? And Peter, Peter changed the word. He said, no, I have philos for you. Now, philos is a love that doesn't cost too much. Yeah, you love, but if it's going to cost you a lot, you're not going to, you're not going to express it. It's kind of a friendly love, okay? And agape is this 100% giving of self. So Peter changed the word. He said, Lord, I have philos for you. Jesus asked him the second time, do you have agape for me? Peter changed the word, I have philosophy for you. The third time, Jesus said, do you have philosophy for me? That's why Peter was grieved. Not because it was three times, but because he was even questioning Peter's philosophy, friendly love. And Peter said, yes, I have, you know, all things I have philosophy for you. Now, after the day of Pentecost, Peter had agape. He gave himself 100% to the Lord. And that's the difference in the terms. Uh, the other... Uh, 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 the other words for love in the New Testament are actually brotherly love. It's called philos. Uh, it's called, called adel philos. Uh, I can't stutter. I'm stuttering philos adel philos. And uh, uh, philos adel phi, brotherly love. Okay, adel philos is, uh, that's actually brother and philos. There's another word, storge, which is family love. And Paul puts two of them together in Romans 12. He says, have philos have brotherly love with family love. He says, have philostorge with, uh, uh, 
uh, I'm getting the words mixed up. He, I said, Philos Adelphia, okay, with Philos Dorge, have brotherly love with family love, meaning teach your brothers and sisters in Christ as members of your family, as well as brothers and sisters. So mercy, again, is reaching down to help someone in need. Faith is unmerited favor. We don't deserve God to forgive our sins. We don't deserve God to not punish our iniquity. We don't deserve God to give us everlasting life. Faith is undeserved. And mercy is just reaching down to help. So God is a combination. That's why chesed in the Old Testament is a combination of agape love. Because it reaches down in mercy and self-giving love. And uh, there's a very fine line difference between the two. But God has both. And he wants us to have both. Can you briefly talk about the book of James? Well, I guess I can talk about it briefly. It's kind of hard because there's so much in it. It's only six chapters. Only, it's only a few chapters. And I actually started teaching it this past Wednesday night. I teach every Wednesday night at Sheffield Family Life Center. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to Sheffield. If you have a church home, you go there. We have services at 9 and 11, Sheffield Family Life Center in the middle of Kansas City. Uh, when I came to came to Kansas City 46 years ago, all my pastor friends told me to get that church out of the city as soon as you can. And I asked them why, and they said suburban people won't drive in. And I told them I didn't know only suburban people were important to God. So we're still down in the inner city. My son's a senior pastor now. I have the title Pastor Emeritus. It means the old guy. I'll be 88 years old in just a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm really young. I, I think they must have made a mistake on my birth certificate. But James has all these truths. And the way I define the book of James, what I tell people, James had to have something to do with the state of Missouri. Because the book of James basically says, you claim you're a Christian, show me. In other words, if I don't see it in your life, I don't have to believe you're a Christian. And really, Paul said the same thing. You know, Paul said, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the ver next verse says, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So James is just saying the same thing, except he's enlarging, enlarging on a little more. Basically, he tells us that you're going to have trials, and the trials rejoice in them. They're going to give you great victory. They're going to cause you to grow. They produce perseverance, and perseverance will help you live for God. Then he talks about every person is tempted, that Satan doesn't tempt anybody. We're uh, God doesn't tempt anybody. Satan is the tempter, but everyone is tempted when they're drawn away by their own strong desire and enticed. And he actually uses the word from a fisher. I, I, you know, the fish sees that nice juicy worm on the hook, but he doesn't see the hook on the inside. And so he grabs the worm and he gets the hook. And that's what James says. Every man is tempted by his own lust. And when lust that's conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, it brings forth death. And he goes on and talks about that. And then the next main topic he talks about is respect the persons. That word did not exist in any Greek literature until it was made up by the church. It's not found in any Greek literature anywhere. It was made up by the church. It's not in the Septuagint translation of the Bible, the Greek translation. It was made up by the church, respect the persons. And James Fratley says you can't have respect the persons and when you do it, you're committing sin. And it, you can't have respect the persons. And this is the illustration I'm going to use tomorrow night. I suppose when someone drives up in front of our church in a Rolls Royce, they have a chauffeur, they have a Brioni suit on, and, a, and they have a diamond Rolex watch. And we say, sir, you sit in the front of the church. And there comes in a street person all shabby. And we say, you sit in back. You're guilty of sin. You're showing respect to persons. You can't have respect to persons become... You can't have respect to persons because someone is of a different economic group than you. You can't have respect to persons be someone because someone is is from a different educational group than you, or someone is a different race or a different color than you. If you have respect to persons, you commit sin. And the Bible makes it very clear that God is not a respecter of persons, and you can't be a respecter of persons. The Bible expects especially churches to teach everybody equally. And we're told that pastors ought to be approachable by everyone. And that's the way it has to be with Christians. And this idea of prejudice and respect to persons is an abomination to God. And God hates it. And unfortunately, we have forces in our country that keep trying to stir it up here. And uh, it's wrong. It's wrong. 
And James is very, very, very strong about that. And then he talks about saying, I'm going to do this or do that, but, but you do it in the will of God. And he talks about be patient to the coming of the Lord. But he talks about all kinds of wisdom and what causes debate and strife and how to have victory over it. And he talks about the coming of the Lord. It says the farmer waits with long patience till he have the early and latter rain. Be patient. The coming of the Lord draws nigh. And he's talking about the parousia, the rapture of the church. The former rain, he says, wait for the former and latter rain. The former rain came on the day of Pentecost. The Old Testament prophesies that God the Spirit would come as the former and latter rain. On the day of Pentecost, he came as the former rain, because in the Middle East, the former rain comes when the seed is planted. The latter rain comes just before the harvest. The latter outpouring of the Holy Spirit began in the late 1800s, spread all over the world now. People baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, people being healed by the power of God. And so we're getting ready. We're getting close to the time when Jesus Christ is coming back. Why did God punish David and Bathsheba's innocent child with death? Well, actually, a child, if they die, goes straight into the presence of God. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. But David pronounces judgment out of his own mouth. He committed adultery. He committed murder. And when Nathan came to him, the story told him the story about the rich man, the poor man that had the little lamb, and the lamb was to him as a daughter, and it sat at his table, and it was the only lamb he had. And the rich man had a stranger come, and he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and gave it to the stranger. And Jesus said, the man, and David said, the man that's done this thing's going to die, and he's going to restore fourfold. And Nathan said, you're the man, fourfold. Number one, the child died. The child went instantly in the presence of God. His son Amnon raped his daughter Tamar. Absalom, his son, murdered Amnon. And then Absalom led a revolt against his father and tried to take the king, did for a short time, and ended up going into eternity with David crying, Absalom, my son, my son, I would God I had died for you. But you know, David truly repented. And when you truly repent, God forgives the past. And God blessed the union between David and Bathsheba and Solomon was born. What is in the past is in the past. Leave it buried under the blood of Christ. You can't go back and change it. And some people that live under guilt and condemnation by other Christians need to understand that. If heaven is a place of sadness, uh, free of sadness, pain and suffering, how can I be happy in heaven knowing that the vast majority of humanity is painfully burning for eternity, especially when some of them may be your loved ones? That is a very difficult question. I'm not sure there's an answer in the Bible. The only answer seems to be in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 5. The dead know not anything. There is not a remembrance. They do not see reward, and there is not a remembrance of them in heaven. Now, I'm not sure you can establish a, a, a Bible doctrine on one verse of Scripture, but that seems to be the only verse in the Bible that says anything. The dead are not remembered. And because right now they are, you know, the Lord took my wife home five years ago. Of course, she's not dead. She's alive in the presence of God. And uh, I hope she's looking for all the rest of us to come. Uh, those are in the presence of God. There's no time in God. It's only going to seem like a second and the rest of us will be there. But to us, it seems like an eternity. But, uh, but, I, but, but I do firmly believe that the memory of those is going to be blot out of the minds. And I can't prove it because one verse of scripture is not something to base a whole doctrine on. What does it mean in 1 Peter 1, 3, that women are the weaker vessels? Talking about physically, uh, men have a stronger frame. Uh, if you study, you'll find out that the frame of a male is like the letter of H to bear I like the letter H to bear weight, and the frame of a woman is like the letter A to, A to bring forth children. And they also say that men's muscles have more. They're a little rougher than women's. Why, why? To bear more weight and more muscle. And so it just means pure physically strong. But it's a great passage of scripture that we're to treat one another with respect or treat your wife with respect. And the woman is to respect her husband. And uh, uh, he mentions in that chapter, if you have an unsaved husband, the way you're, not, the way you're going to reach him is not through your gold or silver or your clothes, but the way you're going to reach him is your attitude. And that... Uh, if you happen to be married to a man that's not saved or a woman that's not saved, the way you're going to reach them is your attitude and your Christian character and your self-giving love. And that's the way you're going to reach them. 
I got a question years ago live on TV, and uh, what Peter is says, you're not going to reach him with the wearing of silver or gold. Uh, and this guy in call said, Christian women aren't supposed to wear silver and gold. You can read that in First Peter. Uh, it's not the adorning of silver and gold. Well, the next verse says the putting on her apparel. See, if you take that verse to mean women, women shouldn't wear gold or silver, it means they shouldn't wear clothes. But what he's saying is you're not going to reach your husband with your outward appearance. You're going to reach him by your attitude. Okay. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, why would God kill Lot's wife, Sarah, by turning her into pillar of salt and simply looking in the wrong direction? Well, it's not that simple. The Hebrew participle indicates she kept lingering further behind as the angels were leading Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says she kept looking back from being behind. She didn't keep up with them. And when fire and brimstone came down, you know, brimstone is basically salt. And undoubtedly, some of it fell on her. And that's what it means she became a pillar of salt. And the illustration I use, they had taken her out of Sodom, but her mind and her eye were still back in Sodom. He, they hadn't taken Sodom out of her, like, okay. And so, so that's the reason for it. She was lingering behind as they were going out. Okay, do we have any more? Okay, be sure and call your questions in because we're uh, we're running low, low, low on questions, I think, aren't we? Okay. Yeah, okay. How is the Christian religion different from all other world religions? And we had a Muslim speak in our church here about three years ago, an ex-Muslim. And uh, he got up in our pulpit and he said, as a Muslim, I examined all the religions of the world. And I found out everything else was a religion except Christianity. And it's a relationship. The Bible says he that has the son has life. He that doesn't have the son does not have life. The Bible says as many as received him, he gives power to become the children of God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Religion is dead. Jesus is alive and well. Now, not only that, but before other religious, other religious leaders were born, you never heard of them. But Israel looked for the coming Messiah because of prophecies all the way through the Bible. The one that would be the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? Isaac had two sons, and, and God picked out Jacob, promised that in, the, in his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. Jacob had 12 sons, and God picked out Judah and indicate the scepter will not depart from Judah till the lawgiver come from between his feet. The word, uh, the word means the one to whom the kingdom belongs until Shiloh come from between his feet. Isaiah indicates he would be born of a virgin 800 years. Uh, 700 years before his birth, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth the son. She'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us, which also indicated that he would make his grave with the wicked and with the wretch. And the word wicked is plural and, and a wealth man is singular. And he was crucified between two thieves and laid in a rich man's tomb. He is wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. By his stripes we have been healed, that he would bear our sin to the cross of Calvary. It says in Isaiah 8, 700 years before his birth, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that took place when Jesus drank the cup in the garden of Gethsemane. That's why he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And God put the sin of every human being that ever has lived or will live on his son and punished him in our place. And Jesus did it willingly. And I remind people, if you'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for you. 400 years before his birth, Zechariah promised to said he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver and the silver would buy the house of the potter and Judas threw it into the house of the Lord and they bought the potter's field. It says he, uh, he would come riding on a donkey and he did that. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is lowly, having salvation, riding upon a donkey, the offspring of a donkey. And Jesus on that Palm Sunday, publicly announcing himself as the Messiah, rode into Jerusalem on that donkey with the people crying, Hosanna, Hoshiana, save us now or please save us. Blessed is he that comes into the name of the Lord. 
and he fulfilled 333 prophecies of the Old Testament. The chance of that happening, the chance of one man fulfilling only eight prophecies that Jesus fulfilled is equal to covering the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars, having an X on one of them, blindfolding a man, telling him to walk through Texas and pick up a silver dollar when he wanted to. Again, his chance of finding that one is equal to Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies and Jesus fulfilled 333 prophecies of the Old Testament. That he would be born in Bethlehem. You recall when the wise men came saying, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. The scribes went to the Old Testament and said in the book of Micah, 800 BC, by the way, it is written, but you Bethlehem on the way to Ephrathah, Yet out of you shall he come forth unto me, whose goings, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting, who shall rule my people Israel. And he came to Bethlehem, and they found the child. The wise men came, and they brought their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, prophetical gifts, gold indicating here is the king. Frankincense was a spice offered to deity, indicating here is one that was more than man. He is also God. And myrrh was a spice to anoint dead bodies. He is the only man in all history born for the purpose of dying. And by the way, there had to be more than three wise men. Wealthy people did not travel across the desert except in a caravan. They had people to take care of the camels. They had people to set up the tents at night. So it was a whole caravan that came. Why do you think they caused such an uproar in Jerusalem? Three people? Do you think three people walking into a big city would cause much of a stir? No, it was a miracle that they came in a caravan and they departed another way after they had been warned. So it's, it's prophesied in the Old Testament and Jesus came and prophesied his death, prophesied his born, and he came and said, I will be raised in three days. He was one of the greatest, one of the best known histories in antiquity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the book, The Case for the Christ, uh, he analyzed, tried to disprove the resurrection, ended up investigating and found out it was a true event. It was, it was one of the best attested facts. Even Muhammad writing the Quran could not deny that Jesus had been seen after his crucifixion 500 years later. And so he said, well, someone else died in his place rather than admit Jesus rose again from the dead. He did admit that Jesus was born of a virgin. As a matter of fact, there's more about the Virgin Mary. We don't even know who Muhammad's mother is in the Quran. And yet there's whole chapters about the Virgin Mary and the virgin birth of Jesus. Who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Okay, the apocalypse is the book of Revelation. And it's uh, the word revelation is the translation of the Greek noun ap apocalypsis, which means to reveal or it also means to show something hidden. For instance, Peter says we have a constant revelation of Jesus Christ as we walk with him and as we know him. But the last book of the Bible in the Greek text is the apocalypsis. And the four horsemen of the apocalypse take place after Jesus starts to open the seven seal book. Uh, the in the first three chapters, we have the word church mentioned 20 to 21 times, church or churches. In chapter 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. You've redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. Made us under all God, kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. In chapter 5, they, uh, uh, John sees Jesus in heaven with a seven-sealed book. Now, I remind you that a book in the Bible is a scroll. Let me get a bigger piece of paper here. A book in the Bible is a scroll. And what's on the inside is the information and, and what's on the outside. And it says, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And a, a mighty angel said, no man. Uh, I saw, I'm uh, sorry, John was caught up to heaven. He sees in the right hand of God sitting on the throne. He has a seven sealed book, sealed, on the, sealed and written on the inside and on the backside. The backside would be the outside. And I heard an angel say, no man in heaven or earth is worthy to take the book and loose the seals. John said, I cried much because no man was worthy to take the book and open the seals. Well, John knew what this was. It was a picture of a mortgage in the Old Testament. And what you have to do to redeem your property is written down on the inside, sealed up. And on the backside is just the name of your nearest relative. If you can't pay your own bill, only your nearest relative can do that. 
So John says, John knows what this is, that Satan mortgaged our inheritance. And you can see Hebrews 2 for the details. God put all things under Adam, but we don't see all things under Adam. Why? You read the Bible. Satan became the ruler of the cosmos, the structure of society. Sin and death and sorrow and pain continued. So John cried until someone could open this mortgage and give man back his inheritance. And then John, here's, here's one say, stop your weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and offspring of David, has prevailed to take the book and loose the seals. And I turned, I saw a lamb as it had been slain, having seven eyes and seven horns to the seven spirits of God. And Jesus walks over and starts opening the seven sealed book. That's when you hear the great praise. You're worthy of you can take the book and open it because you're worthy of praise and honor and glory for you've redeemed us by your blood. That's when he said, out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation, made us unto our God, kings and priests unto our God. Then Jesus starts to open the book. In Revelation chapter 6, I saw when he had opened the book, and I saw a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow. That's a military weapon, a bow and arrow, not the rainbow. And a crown, and this is the victor's crown, the Stephanos. Okay, the Stephanos is the victor's crown. When Jesus comes back, he's, he has the diadems, which are the kingly crown. And it was given unto him, power was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The one that makes his appearance immediately after the rapture of the church is the man of sin. And with the one called the Antichrist, the instead of Christ, this is the imitation Christ. Uh, if you read in First Thessalonians, you know, the apostle Paul mentions the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need that I run to you. For yourself know that the day of the Lord, that's the great tribulation, will come as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman, and they shall not escape. But you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you or the children of light. And he goes on two verses later to say, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the great tribulation is the time of the wrath of God poured out without mercy. Poured out without mercy because they've rejected his son. And the church will not be here during that time. You can't find the word church in the book of Revelation after chapter 4. But the first one that comes on the scene is the Antichrist, the instead of Christ. He gives the imitation. He is the one Israel is going to accept instead of their Messiah for the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living one say, Go. And there went out another horse that was red. Power was given on him to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and it was given unto him a great sword. So this indicates war taking place. When Antichrist comes on the scene, he will deliver peace for a short time. He will be uh, the book of uh, the book of uh, the book of Daniel says he will use flattery to bring peace. But he will have military power behind him, according to the rest of Revelation and many parts of Daniel. It reads in Revelation 13, the dragon Satan. Satan gives this man his power and great his throne and great authority. And he has the armies of the world with him. So he will come on the scene and he will uh, he'll begin to appear as a man of peace, but he will be, end up as a man tr trying to destroy Israel and the Christians. And when he, uh, that's those that will accept Christ during the great tribulation period. Revelation 7 talks about those arrayed in white raiment who are coming. It's a continuous action verb out of the great tribulation period. Many people will be saved during the great tribulation period. They will, they will, not, they will not be raptured until the end. But, but, but the saints that are here when the rapture takes place will be in heaven, those that know Jesus Christ. And when it opened the third seal, I heard in the third and the third beast, it actually should be living ones. This is what, the, what the Greek text says. Come and see. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. That's a scale in our language. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living ones say, a measure of wheat for a denarius and three measures of barley for a denarius, and hurt that not the oil and wine. Now, a denarius in the Bible it, it has a day's wage for one person. And it says a measure of wheat. A measure is the, enough food for a man, a quart and a half a day. That's considered enough for a day. 
So it's going to take a day's wage to buy food for one person. Now, if you want flour soup made with barley, you can, you can feed three people for a day's age. He's talking about worldwide famine. And we can see the world rapidly heading toward that. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living one say, go. And I looked and behold, a, pa a pale horse. Now, now, it's actually chloros, yucky green. It's the word we get our word chlorine from. And his name that said on him was death and hell followed with him, which is what happens to people that don't know Jesus Christ. Hell follows death and death and hell are personified as persons here. And power was given unto them to kill the fourth part of the earth with sword, with hunger, with death and with the beasts of the field. And so there's going to be that killing. Now, those who will accept Jesus Christ during the tribulation, many of them will be killed for their faith. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were killed for the word of God and the testimony they had. And they said with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, that you do not, do not judge and avenge our death blood on them that dwell on the earth. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them, they should wait for a short time uh, until the rest of their brothers were also killed as they were killed should be fulfilled. And that takes place all through the seven years of the great tribulation. And when he had opened the sixth seal, now this is one of the greatest powerful events in the history of the human race. Now, later on, Jesus is going to open the seven seal book. And in the rest of Revelation after that event, at the end of chapter 10, is what what's in the seven seal book and how Jesus is taking our, our property back, his property back from Satan. And the first thing mentioned there is the two witnesses that witnessed for three and a half years. And they believe the two witnesses are causing all these plagues. And when they get killed by the Antichrist, they believe, boy, they give gifts one to another. The two witnesses are dead. And you read Revelation 11, you're going to see it fits in right here. Until this time, they believe that all that's happening is, is caused by these two men. Now, this part of Revelation, that they don't know what it is. But here is something that's going to let them know it's the wrath of God. It is not these two men causing it. And the seven seal book gives more details about the Antichrist. The seven seal book gives more details about Israel. The seven seal book gives the details about the two witnesses and explains why they didn't know until this point this was the wrath of God. And it goes on to say, I beheld when he opened the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon was turned as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. That's the meteorites, folks. It's the same Hebrew word, the same Greek word. Uh, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of the wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. That means looking up tonight, we'll see the dark sky. If you're in the part where it's daylight, you'll see a daylight sky. But the heavens are going to depart as a scroll, and suddenly people will see the throne of God. And they're going to understand that God is doing this. Listen to the rest of it. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. And every mountain and every island, island includes the continents, there's only one word for it, were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty man and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to bear it. They're recognized finally that this is God doing all this. Now the seventh seal is open later. And the, uh, the only thing we're told about the seven seals as the sounding of the seven trumpets that opened the, 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 the announced, announced the opening of the seventh seal. But in chapter 11, as our nearest relative, Jesus puts one foot on the sea, one foot on the dry land. That's why he's pictured a small boat, because that big angel puts one foot on the sea and one foot on the dry land with the boat, with the book open and says there's no more delay. In other words, I'm taking this back. No more time for sin. No more time for death. No more time for sorrow. And the rest of the book of Revelation is how he takes it back. I get excited when I talk about that. I'll be accused of preaching now. There are several Bibles all across the world. How do we know which one is correct? The New American Standard 
is considered the best accurate New Testament we have. They, they, they went back to the oldest manuscripts. It is in good English, and it's the best study Bible you can get, a New American Standard, the NASB, okay, NASB. And every scholar I know says the New American Standard is the most accurate translation we have. Now, some words you can take different words for, some Hebrew words, some Greek words. But the New American Standard goes back to the oldest text, and it's a word-for-word -word translation. It's not a paraphrase. It's not a dynamic equivalent. A dynamic equivalent, what they did, they looked at the Greek and Hebrew text, and they put in their own words what it meant. The, 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 the now, the King James Bible is a word-for-word -word translation, but it was translated in 1611 and was translated from a 12th and actually from a 12th century manuscript. Now, the older older manuscripts have more information; they hadn't been discovered yet in 1611. Now, there's nothing critical that's different, but just some of the wording is different, some of the things. But the New American Standard for a serious study Bible is the one you need to have. Read some of the others. Uh, the New Living Translation, the NIV, are both that dynamic equivalent. Uh, things like the Passion Bible, uh, it, uh, that's actually, actually expanded translation. He adds a whole lot of his own words. Use some literal, but that adds a whole lot of his own words. And it's an expanded translation, and it's as a, it was translated by one person. The Amplified Bible is about the same. It can give you insight often you know, on the meaning of the Greek text, uh, for instance, the present participle under certain situations, it means continuous action. And the, uh, the Amplified Bible tries to bring that out. There's some places it adds a few words that maybe shouldn't be there, but it's a paraphrase. It admits it's a paraphrase. Uh, the message admits it's a paraphrase, put in their own words. The word-for-word -word translations are the New English, uh, New English translation, the New a new American standard of the best ones. A new King James is a word for word translation. But again, the new American standard, if you want a serious study Bible, it's the new American standard. Read the others for information, and uh, but read the new American standard for serious study. What's the meaning of you had not because you asked not in James 4 2? He's trying to teach them to pray, trying to teach them to pray. But then he says, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, so you can. Uh, uh, so you can use it on your own lust, your own strong desires. Well, I want to be rich so I can have a bunch of stuff. Therefore, I'm going to keep on asking. Well, James says you ask amiss so you consume it on your lust. I remind you something else the book of James says. And I should have mentioned that when someone asked about James. James says the poor are rich in faith. Read that in the book of James. The poor are rich in faith. And you listen to some modern preachers, if you don't have a lot of money, it's lack of faith. No, 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 says the poor are rich in faith. Real prosperity in the Bible has little to do with money. It has to do with so many other things, relationships and health and various other things. And so it's, it's almost like the Hebrew word shalom. Is shalom with your family. Is shalom with your wife. Is shalom here, meaning welfare, goodness, and uh, real prosperity. And so, but again, James says the poor are rich in faith. So don't blame people for not having faith if they're not rich, because James says you ask, you consume it on your own lust. Well, I just want to be rich so I have a bunch of stuff. That's your own lust. That's your own lust, okay? Now, God does give back to us, but that doesn't mean he's going to make everybody rich. Some people, if God made you rich, you'd backslide. You wouldn't take any time for God. And uh, so, uh, yeah. So hard to believe heaven is real, even though there are a lot of scriptures talking about it. Could you talk about this? Well, the, yeah, there are, there are a lot of scriptures. It comes down to faith. But you can't live by feeling. You live by faith. And doubt is from the enemy. The enemy puts doubt in our mind. Now, you're in good company. Everyone has doubts. Just look at John the Baptist. The only man the Bible said he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He said, the one that sent me to baptize, the ones that sent me, the one you see the spirit descending, the dove and remaining, that's my son. That's the one that baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And John said, I saw and I bear record. I saw this happen. I heard the voices of my beloved son. And I saw and I be record. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the son of the world. This is the son of God. And then John is thrown into prison 
and he sends two of his disciples to Jesus, and they said, are you really him? So John had doubts when things started going difficult. Things started going hard for him. And so that can happen to you. That can happen when you're going through a difficult time, especially you can wonder, is God there? But read the first chapter of James. You fall into various testings. The testing of your faith works endurance. Let endurance have its complete work that you may be complete in all parts, lacking nothing. And it means a lifetime of process of becoming full grown. And you're going to go through difficulties. Faith is like a muscle. If you don't use it, it's going to atrophy. So faith is simply believing what God said. And so the enemy will put doubts in about everything, that your sins in the past are gone. He'll come along and accuse you that you've done something wrong. God's not going to forgive you. He's a liar and the father of lies. And Paul says, you know what Paul says in Philippians, for your sakes, I'd rather stay here. But as for me, I want to take down this tent and depart and be with Christ, which is much rather better. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so it's... Uh, we either take what the scripture said and the, the doubts, we live with our doubts, just, just understand God's word is true. And pray that God will give you the faith to believe, but just keep reading about it. Uh, it's all the way through the Bible. Okay. So we're getting some questions. When it talks about the dead will rise when the rapture, what does that mean people die or are, are waiting for that time? People die or do they go before God okay right after death okay right after death you go before God uh, if you're a Christian you go into the presence of God the ungodly go into what in the Old Testament is called Sheol in the New Testament is called Hades and Jesus explained that in the story of the rich man and Lazarus in the Old Testament only, you only read of two people going to heaven Enoch and Elijah Enoch didn't die. He walked with God, and God took him for he was not. Elijah was caught up in a chariot of fire. When the Old Testament people died, they were gathered to their fathers. Like Jacob thought his son Joseph had been eaten out of a wild animal, and he said, I'll go to Sheol to my son. That's Hebrew for that place. In Greek, it's Hades. And uh, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail meaning when you're part of the church of Jesus Christ and you be part of the come of that part by receiving Jesus, not by joining an organization. That's what I tell people when I give an altar call when I'm preaching, okay? Like I told them at Sheffield three weeks ago when I preached on Wednesday nights, we're not the way to heaven, but Jesus is the only way. And so when you receive Jesus, the gates of hell will never close around you. The Bible teaches the real you is a soul. We live in a tent called the body and we have a spirit. And again, the Bible says for us, while well, we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. I'm willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when a Christian dies, they go to be with the Lord. Now, they're not asleep, as some people try to say, because they take First Thessalonians, where Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. But that was the idiom in the world, uh, in the Gentile world for death. Uh, we might say they've passed away. They've gone to be with the Lord. They've expired. In the Gentile world, and Thessalonica was a Gentile church, he said, then the sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So my wife, Jean, went to be with the Lord a little over five years ago now. But Jesus died for the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. She, the real herd that lived in that tent, is in the presence of God. And it says in 1 Thessalonians, them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him because a, a resurrected body is going to be rise and join them. Them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive under the coming, uses the Greek word parousia. When it's used without modifiers, it refers to the event we call the rapture. When it's used with the word brightness, it refers to the event when Jesus comes back as king of kings and every eye will see him. But we which are alive under the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. He's already said he's bringing them with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's that's in the book of Revelation, that's come up here, chapter 4. The voice of the archangel, we read in Revelation, Michael the archangel comes to fight for Israel. Daniel 12 talks about the same thing that Revelation 12 talks about. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, so her body will rise to meet it. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to us together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But then he goes on to say, concerning times and seasons, you have no need that to run you, for he's coming as a thief in the night. In other words, you're not going to know the time. People are always trying to predict the time of the day of the rapture. And Jesus said he's coming as a thief. And that's what Paul said. I'm not going to waste time talking about the times of the seasons. He uses the Greek word chronos and kairos, how much time is going to pass, or all the, or the appointed time. And Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, when they said, Lord, you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, Israel now, he said, it's not for you to know the chronos nor the kairos, the amount of time that's going to pass, nor the appointed time that the Father has put in his own hands. It's not for you to know. You're not going to figure it out by the Jewish calendar. You're not going to figure it out by cosmic events. He's coming as a thief in the night. And we're to live as men and women expecting our Lord. But we will have a resurrected body. So we that are alive will be caught up. The dead are coming back to pick up a resurrected body. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But they go. They are with the Lord if they know Jesus Christ. If not, now they're in Hades. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus indicated both of them were in Hades. One side was paradise; the other side was torment. Jesus told the thief on the cross, "Today you're going to be with me in paradise." He said, "As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man, referring to himself." be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he told the thief, today you're going to be with me in paradise. When Jesus resurrected, he emptied all those in paradise and took them to heaven. We read in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul says, I knew a man that was caught up to paradise. Paradise has been moved. The ungodly part is still full of people. When the ungodly die, they go to Hades right now. Okay, their soul spirit, the body grows in and around. They're not going to be resurrected till Revelation chapter 20 after the thousand year reign of peace. And so it's all in the chronology of Revelation. And I just happened to have my Revelation book sitting here. I thought that'd be a good place to put it. Many of you know, I wrote a textbook for colleges about 20 years ago. It's used in 80 countries of the world in Bible colleges. It's been translated into over 40 languages. But in that book, I had to examine all the different opinions of why they were right and why they were wrong. And they had to separate Daniel and put it separate from Revelation. But when I teach Revelation, I put Daniel where it fits. And, and so I wrote a book on Revelation, and it's in simple language. Okay, I remind pastors when I teach them that Jesus used eighth grade language. Okay, because he's want everyone to understand him, what he said. And the New Testament is written in that kind of language. It's what I call street Greek. It is a long way from classical Greek. It's written in the common Greek of the streets. If he was writing today, if he saw a brother, he'd say, how you doing, bro? But it's written in, in, the, uh, in the English street Greek of that day. And so God wanted everybody to understand it. So I wrote this book in simple language. And even though I taught Greek for 25 years, I use Greek words, but I explain what they mean and why they are there in that location but it's written simply so you can understand it. And I wrote it on an eight and a half by 11 format so people can see the charts of things like the 77s of Daniel in the book of Revelation. I put Daniel where it fits in Revelation. I put Matthew 24 where it fits in Revelation. I put the Thessalonian letters and other prophecies where they fit into the story of the book of Revelation. Because without the book of Revelation, we don't know how the story ends. And it's the conclusion of everything God has to say in that book. So it's simply explained. We have charts and diagrams to explain everything. It's also an, There's also an appendix about the word of God, uh, the word for God, whether it's Jehovah or whether it's Jesus, okay, which is correct. And, and there's also an article in the back on the fact that Jesus created all things, so he himself is not part of creation. There's a false teaching that God created Jesus and Jesus created everything else. And the New Testament makes it clear that Jesus is the firstborn, meaning preeminent, because if you read your Bible, Jacob made, uh, uh, he made Joseph the firstborn, and Joseph was his 11th son. Joseph was his 11th son, and Jacob appointed him the firstborn. Israel is called the firstborn nation. And so it indicates in Colossians that he is the firstborn of every creation. Why? For by him were the all things created. The all things is a phrase made up by the Roman 
uh, uh, by the Greek poet Homer, who wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad several hundred years before the birth of Christ. And it means everything that exists. And he says, for by him were the all things created. It was a common phrase in, in the time of the Apostle Paul. For by him were the all things created. He is the head of the body, the firstborn from the church. He is the firstborn of the dead. And it goes on to say that for by him, God, it pleased God that he should be preeminent. And so he is the firstborn. There's a whole article on the firstborn in the appendix at the back. There's an article on how the Antichrist shows up in Daniel chapter 8 and 9 and how those prophecies jump from that time into the latter days. But it's very simply explained. It's called chapter 66, Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ simply explained. The true meaning of the book is not the revelation of John. Those titles were added in the Middle Ages. The true meaning of the book is the first sentence, the revelation of Jesus Christ. There are 26 different pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation, and they're spelled out for you here in this book. Again, it's six, simply explained, eight and a half by 11, and the charts and diagrams are easy to read because it's that larger print. And you can get it off YouTube, not YouTube, I'm sorry, eBay. You get it off eBay. Uh, chapter 66, or you can look on my name, and and there's a number there. If you look on, if you look on Facebook under my name, George Westlake. If you look under my name, there's a number down there somewhere you can order it by. But otherwise, you can order Chapter 66 by George Westlake from eBay, and it will be sent to you. And we mail them out about the day after we get them. Okay, we mail them out about the day after we get them. And uh, but, but this is the way I see Revelation after having studied it for over 60 years. Again. Uh, again, I'll be 88 next month. Um, it's the way I see it. And I've tried to fit everything together as it should be. Why the church will not be here during the Great Tribulation, despite of what you're hearing. And by the way, I, someone told me there's a program saying all these things in the Bible are aliens. There are no aliens in the Bible. No aliens in any place whatsoever. Totally incomprehensible that someone tried to read aliens into that. Can you discuss legalisms? Uh, legalisms are what people come down with. Well, you've got to keep the you've got to keep the Jewish Sabbath. You got to keep the Jewish Sabbath day, which is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. If you're not keeping that, you're you're sinning. Other people say, well, you got to keep the Lord's day, which is Sunday. If you're not keeping that, you're sinning. Other people say, well, the Old Testament says you can't eat pork, and they try to put that on people. Now, the New Testament makes it clear we are not under the legalisms of the Old Testament. We are not under any kind of diet restrictions in the New Testament. You are not under any obligation to keep a certain day. We are not under any obligations to dress a certain way. But the, now the moral principles of the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament. Uh, what I mentioned uh, and I think I mentioned it last Wednesday night again. I may have or I may not. But in the Old Testament, the all of those things, the, the Ten Commandments, Arrasi taught in the book of Colossians, were nailed to the cross. But nine of them are repeated in the New Testament for the Christian, not as legalisms, but as obeying the principles of righteousness. And the only one that's not repeated for the Christian is keeping the Sabbath day. But people try to come up with legalisms because they find it in the Old Testament. I got a question last week, and I didn't get, I didn't get to it. I don't want to go to all the details that brother said, but he was criticizing Christians that get tattoos. Now, tattoos in the Old Testament are wrong, okay? But it, that 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 you can't pick one legalism out of the Old Testament and say that's for today, okay? If and I tell people, if you're going to try to keep the Old Testament law, you better build a fence around your roof. Because the book of Deuteronomy says it's a sin if you don't build your fence around the roof, uh, around your roof. Or, or if, you owe, uh, if you owe debt, you can put your daughters out as indentured slaves to pay off your debt. And I don't think your daughters would go for that today. I think they'd rebel against you. And so you can't go all these legalisms in the Old Testament. Why didn't God tell him not to eat pork? He was going to say in this climate, you get a trichinosis or a tapeworm. He just said, don't eat it. But regardless of why he told them not to eat it, it was to be separate from their neighbors. Christians are different in our attitude. Our attitude, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control, not in our legalisms. And a lot of people like the words translated 
worldly. They say that's worldly. Well, the world drives cars, so they say you shouldn't drive cars. No, we come up with all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is what John says. A number of years ago, I had a ticket to a Monday night game. Someone was taking me to a Monday night game at Arrowhead. And I was preaching. I said, tomorrow night, I'm going to go to Arrowhead, and I'm going to, ooh, 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 like everyone else. I had a sister come up to me after service. She said, Pastor Westlake, I know I was in trouble. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're going to Arrowhead tomorrow night? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, they sell beer at Arrowhead. I said, sister, do you buy your groceries at Price Chopper? She said, yes. I said, they sell beer at Price Chopper. She said, I don't buy it. I said, I don't drink it. Some people can become legalistic over things like that. I can get real, real legalistic about golf because I hate the game. I don't play it anymore. And I could condemn people to hell for playing golf because I don't like it. But now don't mess with football because I like to watch that. You see, that, that that's what some people do with legalism. Uh, they pick one thing from the Old Testament and try to make an issue out of it. A number of years ago, a lot of our young people were getting criticized because they had an earring, and some of them had rings in other places, and some of the older people were critical. And I had all the young people that had that stand up on a Sunday morning, all those of high school age. I want you to stand up. And I say, now, these are the young people that caused the local principal of Northeast High School to send me a letter and say our school is different because your young people are there. Okay, so you leave these kids alone. We can get so upset with legalisms from the Old Testament that have no place today. If a Christian wants to get a tattoo, let them get a tattoo. Now, some countries you can't do that. In Latin America, you get one if you're a member of one of the drug cartels. So the pastors down there are very against tattoos. In Asia, it can actually be a false religion. But in our country, it's amoral. That means it's not good, it's not bad. It's what you're getting. And uh, some of the best Christians I know get tattoos. I know a church that has a Christian tattoo. They use it for a witnessing tool. And so you can't take a legalism or the Old Testament and put it in the New Testament. Those were nailed to the cross. They are not valid today. The moral principles are valid. We fulfill the righteousness of the law, but we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That, but that's legalism. Is Greek theology... Is Greek my theology? Mythology. Oh, Greek mythology real? No, it's exactly what it is, myth. It's exactly what it is, myth. Greek mythology is not Ru Ru Zeus and Apollos and Diana. None of those. It came out of the stories by people like, uh, like Homer that wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad and various Greek poets and things like that. Okay, they developed human gods. Now, that's why Luke wrote to the that's why Luke's gospel was written to the Greeks. And it goes back and starts, starts the genealogy of Jesus all the way to Adam. Matthew only goes back to Abraham because it's the gospel to the Jews. But he goes all the way back to Adam to show that Jesus is the last Adam, the perfect man who didn't fail where all other people has failed. Remember, we, we make a mistake calling the Bible the good book. There's only one good person in it. That's Jesus. Everybody else is just like us. Thank God everybody else is just like us. Because Jesus died for all of us. If there are angels, why were humans created? Because God wanted angels were not created in the image of God. All right? God wanted someone in his image to glorify him and have a relationship with. Jesus said, I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and feast with that person. And that person will feast with me. God wanted people he could love and love him back in return. And angels can't do that. They have to be created in his image. I know we were created to praise him. I am understanding that. But why put us on earth? Is earth a cast, a, a cast and select? I'm not understand that. Cast and select. A test who really deserves heaven? Or, or a game to choose who is worshiping. No, it's just to give us a choice where we're going to spend eternity. Love has to be by choice. A robot can't love you. Okay, you can go to the, you can go somewhere and buy a robot now, put batteries in, it'll say beep, 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 I love you, but it doesn't love you. Love has to be by choice. And God had to give us a free will. Every child is born with a free will. Why do you think children are stubborn? They're not born guilty of sin. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, we're, we're born surrounded by it. We're born under its influence. We're born under the influence of the enemy. 
And the enemy can put thoughts to diffuse your free will out of your parents' will in a child as he puts thoughts in an adult to sin out of God's will because the battleground is the mind. But we're born into a free world to make a choice. That's why it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we, uh, he created us to make a choice where we're going to spend eternity. And we can't let our self-will get in the way of obedience to him. And so that's why he created us. He wanted to love us and wanted someone to love him back. That's why I tell people, every, I have them repeat, you are, you are as important to God as any person that has ever lived. God loves you as if you're the only one he ever had to love. And if you'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for you. I've had congregations repeat that all over the world. And so that, that that's a fact of truth because he wants you to love, but you've got to open your heart. If you open your heart, you give God a feast. I'm reminded Jesus when, when he was talking to the woman of Samaria, the apostles have gone away to buy food. And they came back and said, Master, we've got food. Jesus said, I've already eaten. I've got food you don't know of. Why? The woman of Samaria had opened her heart to him. And you give God a feast when you open your heart to him. And he turns around and gives you real life. When we all meet up again in the rapture after the trumpet sounds, do we ever come back to earth? Yes, we come back and rule with Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon. Okay, the last trumpet is actually something that affects a whole lot of time. Uh, the Bible talks about the rapture, uh, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. Actually, the trumpet of God, if you read Isaiah 27, talks about the last trumpet. That's not one of the seven trumpets. In the book of Revelation, you have seven angels blowing trumpets. Those are the... Uh, are heralding the opening of the seven seal book and want to see what's on the inside. Uh, it's like when the king would carry a message into a city, they blow trumpets and the people would gather, they'd open the okay, they'd open the document. So you have the seven trumpets blowing the opening of the of the seven sealed book, all right? And then we find out what's in the seven seal book as we go on in Revelation. But the trumpet of God, those are trumpets of angels. And the book of Hebrews talks about the first trumpet it's sounding at Mount Sinai. What it did at Mount Sinai was assemble the people as the nation, as, as the people of Israel. It reassembled Israel, okay? The last trumpet will sound to reassemble Israel as God's people. And that will take place during the tribulation period. So it's a period of time. Last three and a half years is when Israel will finally recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah in the middle of the seven years. And also the voice of the archangel. If you read Revelation 13 and Daniel chapter 12, as uh, in Revelation 12 and Daniel 12, Michael comes on the scene to fight for Israel. The same things described in both chapters, Revelation 12 and Daniel 12. And so the sounding of the last trumpet reassembles Israel. The way I describe it in the Old Testament Israel is God's exhibit A on earth. During the church age, the church is exhibit A. Israel is exhibit B. When the church is removed at the rapture, Israel will again be exhibit A. Okay? And so that's why the trumpet sounds. Okay. I know the Antichrist comes from Jews in descent, but what about the high priest? Of course, they both must come from Jews. Uh, from Jewish descent. They have to be a descendant of Aaron to be a high priest. Have to be a descendant of Aaron in order to be a high priest. And that's one thing the book of Hebrews points out. Jesus is not a descendant of Aaron. He's a descendant of Judah. And only the Aaronic priesthood can administer the law. And God has changed the priesthood to a king priest. Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And since only the Levitical priesthood can administer the law, since God in his sovereignty has changed the priesthood, he has also changed the law. Later on, says God has abolished it. And that's what happened to Calvary. Okay. I'm going to have to look this verse up. I don't know what it says. I've got my Bible on my lap. Uh, what's in 1 Timothy 5 8? So let me see what, okay, let me see what 1 Timothy 5 8 says. Because, because I don't learn chapter and verses, okay? I try to ignore the chapter and verses when I read the Bible because they sometimes interrupt what God is trying to say. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Let me get over here really quick. Chapter 5, 8. If any provide not for his own, he is worse than an infant, especially those of his own house, 
he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Well, yeah, you have to take care of your family, uh, whether it be a widowed mother that needs help or whether it be a son or a daughter or, or, or someone that needs help. You have to take care of your own house. You have to provide for them, okay? Worse than an infidel. If you just say, well, you're starving, but I don't want to give you food, or if you just say you got a bill and I don't want to help you, if you're able to, you know, sometimes you can't, but if you're able to, if you're not taking for your own, you're worse than an infidel. God expects us to take care of those we love. And Paul mentions, oh, oh, I, you know, they feed the widows. Okay, okay, but he said, don't feed the widows because they're, they're going to marry again. Okay, the young widows. Why was God going to kill Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 24 to 26? It's actually a Hebrew participle. God, uh, uh, he was seeking a continuous action verb to kill Moses, meaning he was making Moses sick. Now, Moses, Moses was obeying him on the way to deliver Israel. He was, he was going. He was on his way. Why did God meet him in the end and seek to kill him? Because he had not circumcised his son. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant. Abraham was declared righteous when he was about 85. But when God promised him a son, he entered into a covenant relationship. And God changed Abraham's name and he changed Sarah's name. Her name was Sarai. His name was Abram. And God's name in the Old Testament is YHWH. So when God adds his name to yours, he adds an H. So he became Abraham and Sarai became Sarah. God gave Abraham something by putting his name in their name. And a, because when you made a covenant with someone, you had to exchange things. And he asked Abraham to give the foreskin. So that became the sign of the covenant. Okay. And so Abraham had not circumcised his, his son. His wife was against it. So if you read the story, she circumcised his son threw the foreskin at Abraham, said, you're a bloody husband, and God let him go. He was going to deliver the covenant people, and he wasn't keeping the covenant. So he couldn't, couldn't deliver the covenant people. If he wasn't keeping the covenant, he was disobeying God. Uh, Moses was always, always, uh, uh, you think he'd finally grow up, but he always got mad at God. He always... Uh, when they when they wanted food, when they want they're tired of the manna, they got sick and tired of it. They wanted flesh, and Moses got so upset. He said, "God, who am I that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Have I given birth to them that you say carry them as a nursing father into the land that you swear to their fathers? I can't stand anymore. Kill me." Now God ignored that prayer. God, but but I when he just got fed up with the whole thing more than once. Later on, God says, speak to the rock. Moses said no, and he got mad at it and hit the rock. I bring water on the rock for you rebels. And because God told him to speak, God said, you're not going to go to the promised land. You're not going to lead them in. Joshua will do that. Why? That was also a spiritual principle. Moses gave the law. Joshua is the same name. It's the Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua. Yeshua is the only one that could lead you in the promised land. Law can't lead you there. Moses gave the law. But he couldn't go to the promised land. Now, I don't know, 1,400 years later, though, he stood with Jesus in the promised land with Elijah and Jesus and Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he saw Jesus transfigured before him. So, so, so he did get to go, but uh, we're not under that law. Could you explain 1 Corinthians 5, 5? But again, I can turn right to uh, they used to ask me on television the question. You know, I just turned to it, but I can't. Uh, I, I got some paper clips on here from. I was already studying for tomorrow night. First Corinthians five five. First Corinthians five five. Okay, well. Uh, you got to read the whole context. Got to read the whole context here. You can't pull it out. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now, fornication, uh, the Greek word that we get our word pornography from, porne means any kind of sex outside of marriage, okay? Any kind of sex outside of marriage among you. And such fornication as the Gentiles wouldn't even think that a man should have his father's wife. That's his stepmother. That's idiom for his stepmother, your father's wife. In other words, he was having a sexual affair with his stepmother. And you are puffed up 
and have not mourned that the person that has uh, has practiced this deed, uh, it's the Greek verb proso, continuous action, was practicing this deed might be taken away from among you because they were just allowing that to go on. Oh, well, God's a forgiving God. You can keep on practicing sin. For I truly, as, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were already present concerning the man that has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit, in other words, I've already agreed with the situation. I've already passed judgment on it. This is what I feel the spirit directing me. Anytime Paul used spirit. Uh, I like the way Gordon Fee writes the word spirit in Paul's writing. He writes it with a big S and then a small S, P-I-R-I-T, meaning Paul is always talking about my spirit, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's already made a decision under the direction of the Spirit that he that is the power of the Lord to deliver such a man to the destruction of the flesh, okay, to be physically destroyed, that the Spirit might be saved. In other words, make him so sick he's going to cry out to God. And then if you read 2 Corinthians, Paul tells him to receive this man back in again. So apparently he repented, and he says, receive him back in lest he be overcome with much sorrow. So apparently the man repented, but he's saying you can't tolerate with this kind of continuous sin going on in the church. And so you have to do something about it. Don't forget churches were house churches. So everybody knew what was going on all the time, all the time. In the gospel of Mark, what was the meaning and purpose of Jesus' temptations? If he was perfect and couldn't, well, he could give in because he was 100% human. His temptations were as a man, not as God. He was 100% God, 100% man. That blows my fuse. Okay, every fuse in my head just goes pop, 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 pop. Blows every fuse I had in my head. I've mentioned many times before when Gene used to do the call in, live call in question and answer Bible program with me on TV. Someone calls to explain the Trinity. I say, can't explain her, let alone the Trinity. What makes you think I can explain that, that God exists in three persons? Point in time, God the Son became a human being. He was tempted, and he did not use anything not available to us. Turn the stones into bread. You're human, okay? You've been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Use your power as God outside of your Father's will. Jesus used a, excuse me, and Jesus used the sword of the Spirit. He attacked the enemy. It is written, you shall worship you shall not, the man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Secondly, prove you're the son of God, or he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All this you can have in a moment of time if you'll fall down and worship me. Jesus said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, took the sword of the spirit. Third thing, prove you're the son of God. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. And Satan can even quote scripture out of context of what cults do. because They pull a phrase out and make it mean something it doesn't say. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall not put your Lord, your God, to the test. Satan quoted the psalm, cast yourself down from his, he'll give his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot in a stone. And so Jesus used the sword of the spirit again. He overcame as a man the same temptation we can have as a man. So he showed us how we can overcome by using the word of God. But he was tempted in all points like as we are, it says in the book of Hebrews. You think he wasn't tempted not to drink all the sin of the world in the Garden of Gethsemane? You think he wasn't tempted not to go to the cross and bear the wrath of God on all of our sin and be separated from his father for the first time in eternity? You think that didn't bother him? Yes, he was human. 100% human, 100% God. All right. Oops, I already answered that one. Okay, we got two minutes, okay? Uh, I'll get these other ones next week. I want to give you opportunity, if you don't know Jesus Christ, to open your heart to him and start living abundant life in him. So just pray this simple prayer if you really want to know Jesus. Father, I ask in Jesus' name, please forgive my sins. I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to live for you. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I give you my life. I give you everything I am, everything I hope to be me right now. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I, help me to live for you from now on. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church and me to tell others about you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
He'll change your life. Change your life. You need to find a good Bible-believing church. There's many in every city. There's many in Kansas City. Don't go by the names over the door. There are many Bible-believing churches in Kansas City that give people opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. If you don't have a church home, you live in this area. We have people come 50 miles on Sunday morning to church. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We have service at 9 and 11 Sunday morning. We have Sunday we have Bible classes for the children and the young adults and the singles uh, and the youth on Sunday morning. And then we also have Bible classes for adults at nine o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock, we have children's services and the youth come into the main auditorium. We have service at 11. And then on Wednesday nights, we have children's services. We have youth services. We have young adult service. We have married couples fellowship. And we also have the Bible study that I teach in the chapel on Wednesday nights. And I'm currently teaching the book of James. When we're done with that, we're going to the book of Hebrews verse by verse. So if you don't have a church home, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. Our website is SFLC for Sheffield Family Life Center, sflc.net. And you can find out more about the church. God bless you. Thank you for watching. And don't forget the book on Revelation. It's available on YouTube, chapter 66 by George Westlake. Revelation simply explained. God bless you. Can't find. Oh, there it is. There.